morning, everybody. Man, what a nice crowd we have. Are you awake? No, all right, let's wake up just a little bit. Let's sing together, the books of the New Testament. If you need to, uh, feel free to look on the screen. I'd prefer if you didn't have to, that'd be great. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and the letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, it's Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, it's Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. You awake? Let's go one more. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts of the Letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, he he Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. You have them down? I just wanted you to prove to yourself. You still know the books of the New Testament. Very well done. I hope you are awake now. Okay, so... Uh, we are looking at the preacher epistles, and we're so glad to have all of our visitors with our regulars also. The preacher epistles. How many of those are there? Preacher epistles. Okay, sorry. Preacher epistles. There are trace of them. Very good. And they are, of course, along with what you see, Titus. What else? First and second Timothy. Okay. What is our key word that we've learned for all three of these? What do they have in common? One word. It's five letters long. Huh? Okay, well, that's true. <laughs> I'll give you that. I wouldn't count that wrong on a test, okay? Uh, but, but what else? Truth. Very good. It's all about the truth. And with the truth, we are, with these three letters, PRing the truth each time. All right, with 1 Timothy, what were we doing? PRing the truth. We were protecting it, and here's why. We've been given a tremendous asset, a valuable treasure. And when you get something that's worth so much, what do you want to do? First of all, you protect that at all costs. Don't allow it to be diluted. Don't allow someone to steal that truth away from you. But at the same time, once you learn how valuable this truth is and, and how much there is of it, you recognize you can keep all you want for yourself, but also you can share as much with others and you don't lose anything. In fact, it only enhances the treasure. So what were we PRing with 2 Timothy? Preaching the truth. We're sharing it with others. Okay, it's been a while since I've mentioned it and we haven't truly studied this yet. But with Titus, does anybody recall what PRing we're going to be doing with the truth now? Practicing the truth. Excellent. I heard a few of you say it. So uh, we want to make sure that whatever we're protecting, whatever we're preaching, we are also practicing that ourselves. And that's where our study of Titus rolls in. We're going to introduce the letter this morning, and the plans are to get just a little bit into the text also in chapter 1. So I have two softball questions I'm going to give you about this letter. The first one is, who wrote Titus? <laughs> All right, you're welcome for that one. It's, it's home run derby is all that is, okay? All right, so the Apostle Paul wrote it. How do we know that? Well, look in the very first verse, and you're going to find as the first word in verse 1, Paul. All right, that's pretty simple. So Paul wrote this, of course, by the inspiration and the direction of the Holy Spirit. If you'd like to know time frame, I do enjoy discussing these. I think it helps us to set a context for what we're going to be studying it's believed to be written somewhere between A.D. 65 and 67. And this is pretty comparable to First and Second Timothy. So we learn in First Timothy that it's thought to be written historically. We're looking at somewhere between A.D. 64 and 67. Okay, First Timothy, 64 to 67. Titus thought to be between these two writings, 65 to 67, in that range, and does anybody remember Timothy when we believe it was probably written? Very close to these. Okay, there you go. 67, right. 67, 68, somewhere in that range. And so you have 1 Timothy, 64 to 67. You have Titus, and that's 65 to 67. 2 Timothy, the last letter that we have of inspiration that Paul wrote, 67 and 68. As far as 
from where this letter was composed. Turn to chapter 3 of Titus. Titus 3, where we're going to read in verse 14, or excuse me, verse 12. He speaks to the preacher, when I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus. All right, we've already encountered Tychicus back in 2 Timothy. We saw Tychicus in Colossians as well, and we see Tychicus in, in Titus. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. I don't know if you would share this in common with me, but when I read about Nicopolis, I'm like, where? That's what I want to know. And so I'm going to show you on the map, uh, Nicopolis uh, is a part of the Aegean Peninsula, kind of like right around the dividing line of Achaia and Macedonia, and I'll show those on the map here a little bit later. But it's, it's thought to, and, and by the way, if, if you're wondering whenever you read this, he says, I decided to spend the winter there at Nicopolis. And you've probably heard that whenever you're there, you're not here. And whenever you're here, you're not all there. Okay, well, uh, just because he uses this word there doesn't necessarily mean he's not here <laughs> at that time. All, all it simply means, it could be translated at that place. And so it, it could be that he's already at Nicopolis. If, if not, he's probably somewhere right around there. And so that's where he writes this letter, and he, he ships it off to what place? Does anybody know? Where is Titus found right now? Chapter, okay, good. So chapter 1, verse 5, excellent, Roy. We're going to find out that he's basically due south of where Paul is staying right now on the island of Crete. And he's going to be helping out there multiple congregations, kind of like, uh, you know, Galatia, the churches of Galatia. And so he ships that off there. It's thought also that he probably writes the letter because of the close proximity from either this town or this area and ships it off to Timothy. Where's Timothy located, we've learned? In Ephesus, basically due east in Asia Minor. And that's from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. But I do want to point that out. Just because the, the word is translated there, it can also be translated at that place. And he says, I, I want you to... Uh, come to me, be diligent to find me at Nicopolis. He's probably either already there or he's going to be close by and he's going to spend the winter in that location. So, to whom is Titus written? You've already got two. You barely even had to swing. <laughs> okay. Titus, right? It's, it's written to Titus. But a little more intensively, who exactly is this guy? Well, uh, we find that it's written to him in chapter 1 and verse 4, kind of like the uh, addresser. Okay, he's the addressee in verse 4 to Titus. We know that it's written to him. And I know it's not stated right here in this passage, but we're going to find it in our study today and especially moving forward that he's a minister, like Paul is, a minister like Timothy is. Uh, speaking of whom, he shares some things in common with Timothy. I ask you to turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2. I know I only have verse 3 on the screen, but we're actually going to back up and read 1 through 3 in Galatians second chapter. Chapter 2, verse 1. The apostle says that after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Now you trace this back 14 years and this is shortly after the first missionary tour of Paul, okay, after 14 years. First missionary tour, chapters 13 and, and 14 of Acts, then chapter 15. Do you, you recall Paul going up with Barnabas to Jerusalem for any important purpose? 15th chapter of Acts. That's the Jerusalem conference. Sometimes we hear the Jerusalem Council. I don't really like that a lot. It's not a legislative body that met to make rules for the church. It's a conference. It's just a meeting of Christians who have gotten together to try to sort out a very important issue. What important issue is that by Acts 15? That's it right there. Because back in, in chapter 10 in the retelling with Cornelius, word travels very slowly. Traditions change very slowly <laughs> in religion. And this is a tradition that needs to change. The Gentiles need to be accepted into the church. And, and not like 
well, in, in a few years, like yesterday. Gentiles need to be accepted as equals with the Jews. Okay, so keep that in mind. Galatians 2, verse 1, he says, after 14 years, and this matches up very well with our timeline, I went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, seems to be Acts 15 and the events there. Notice, taking Titus along with me. So this guy's been a Christian for a long time. He's been, as we're going to find a companion of, of Paul for a number of years. Okay, very good. You're, you're exactly right. He says, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential. Always smart when you're going into a, a meeting, uh, not just to throw everything on, on everybody all at once. Uh, who are the ones who are highly respected? Who are the ones who pull a lot of weight? Hey, why don't we have dinner before this meeting together? Let's talk about a few things. <laughs> Try to get everyone on the same page so as the meeting goes smoother. And that's what he did. He met privately with those who seemed to be influential. He says, I set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, this is a new concept, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. He's not of Jewish background. He is a Gentile, and in that he shares something in common with Timothy. Now from what we find right here, what do we not find in common with Timothy? Timothy is a Gentile and is going to do some work with Paul. What does he do? Okay, or, or maybe I should say, what does he have done to him? <laughs> and yeah, he's circumcised, helped squelch some of this. Uh, Titus, he was not forced to be circumcised. And perhaps this meeting is uh, some help in that. So as Andrea pointed out to us, he is not of Jewish descent. He is a Gentile. And from what we find in chapter 1, verse 4 of our letter, it appears that the Apostle Paul is the one who taught him the gospel and, and who encouraged him to respond to it. Verse 4 of Titus 1, he writes to Timothy, who is a true son, he says, in our common faith. We'll discuss that prepositional phrase more later. But for right now, he is a true son. Notice he's, he's not a son in the flesh, but he's a son in the faith. I don't have this on the screen, but turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. When Paul uses this terminology, it has some spiritual significance. 1 Corinthians 4, and we're going to read verses 14 through 17 about this concept, Paul calling people his children. Just to refresh our minds, verse 14, I do not write these things to you to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. So why does he call this, this group of people, a whole church, his kids? Uh, we know he's not the kids in, in the flesh. He goes on to say in verse 15, For though you have countless guides or teachers in Christ, and he's addressed that going back to chapter 1 on through 3, he said, There's a difference with me. You do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I begot you, or I, or I helped you to have life again, and I'm the only one of whom that can be said, even though you have a lot of people teaching you the ways of Jesus right now. What's he mean by that? Okay, I, I put the seed, God's word, in your heart. I was the first person to do that, and you respond to it, so as Jesus would say it, you have been born again. You became a baby in Christ, and I am your father, so to speak, in that, and that I taught you the gospel. Okay, continue down to verse 16 of the same passage. I urge you then, uh, I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So he says, You are my kids, and what I mean by that is, I'm the one who taught you the gospel. Well, I'm sending to you a beloved and faithful son of mine named Timothy. Okay, let's put two and two together. What might we rightly conclude about Timothy now? But that Paul taught him the gospel. Okay, so I say that to say this. When we go back to Titus in chapter 1, verse 4, when he calls Titus a true son in the common faith, what might we rightly ascertain now about Titus? But that Paul had taught this Gentile man 
the gospel also. And if we know that he's a part of, of the efforts in the Jerusalem conference from what we read in Galatians 2, and that goes back to Acts chapter 15, that means that he must have been converted sometime before Acts 15. Well, the gospel hadn't been shared with the Gentiles for very long, going back to, to chapter 10. And what you find between the two is the first missionary effort of Paul, and he's going to all these churches with, with Barnabas, or all these places, establishing churches in Gentile communities. That's where Timothy is converted in Acts 14, and I believe that's probably also where Titus is converted. Go back to chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, and we just studied this recently, so that helps. But I want to be reminded of what we just learned in verses 9 and 10. So Paul encourages Timothy, he says, Be diligent to come to me quickly. I need you now. Here's why. I am all alone, in verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Now, let's not forget that it's believed 2 Timothy is, is written after Titus. And so, Titus is in a different place by now. Uh, you know, a year, a couple years, a few years maybe down the road. But here's what we find out. Paul, of course, is in prison, we know from 2 Timothy. He is imprisoned at Rome. And there have been all these preachers who are with him that are no longer with him. He has uh, sent off Titus to Dalmatia, which is found to the north of the province of Macedonia. He has, uh, of course, sent off Cretans, it appears, to Galatia, over on the east side of the screen. He has sent, of course, uh, uh, he mentions uh, Timothy and, and John Mark. Of course, they're in, in Ephesus at this point. But I also want you to notice right up here, Demas. Now, this one's different compared to the rest because it's stated Demas has forsaken me and has left it seems that he's just quit the, the ministry and probably the, the faith altogether. He's in love with this present world. But my question to you is this. He goes on into verse 11. He says, only Luke is with me. Timothy, now I want you to come to me shortly. He's having, it seems, all these ministers to come from around the world and to come visit him where he's found at Rome. And then it's like he just turns around and ships them all off. Luke is also with him, but he doesn't ship Luke off. He keeps Luke with him. Any ideas as to how to explain that? There you go. Where do you ever find that Luke's an evangelist? What good's it going to do for Paul to ship off a guy whose, whose talent doesn't appear to be in preaching? That's not, that's not who he is. What does he do? He writes. He's a talented writer. Okay. What else does he do for Paul? What's his background? He's a physician, and so undoubtedly he cares for the apostles' needs and those who are on the missionary team, he's valuable to keep around, and, and we have no indication that he's a preacher, so, so why send him off in a preacherly role when that's not his gift in the church? But all these people are coming to visit Paul, but none of them are staying. Now, it's not mentioned that anyone forsakes him other than one, it's just that they depart to go do work, I believe, elsewhere. So why is Paul, does it seem, calling all these, like he is with Timothy, all these preachers to him just turn around and sending them off? What's about to happen in Paul's life? His life's almost to end. And I believe just like he does with Timothy, just like he does with Titus, he wants to, in, in person, encourage them one more time. Stay true to the end. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And, and, and you need that, you know, as, a, as an electric guy. You know, I can appreciate that. Your batteries need recharged from time to time. Yeah. Uh, so he sent him, but the other thing I think is this, on a personal level, how long has he known all these guys, or a, a number of them anyway? He has worked in the gospel with them for two decades. These guys are closer than family right now. Do you think he might want to say goodbye to them? I think he might want to hug them and tell them <laughs> that he loves them? But I, I think it's by design that Paul is calling all these ministers to him at Rome and shipping them back out to do the work of God. He's done that with, with Timothy and he's writing to Titus, hey, come on, come see, I want to see you. Uh, let's visit some more. I have a few things that I want to tell you in person. Uh, this is probably the last time that you ever see me. I, I want to tell you not goodbye, but see you later. And then he's going to ship him off, just like we've seen with Timothy and the rest of these. Uh, again, Luke makes a lot of sense. He stays put. He's not a minister. 
he is a physician. He attends to the apostles' needs and those who are, are with him. And maybe his, his most, undoubtedly, his most important role is the recording of, of the church's history, the only person to do such a thing. All right, so he's a fellow missionary in Paul's uh, evangelistic efforts. We do know that. He's, he's shipped around the world, and we'll talk about here in a moment just how many places he's been. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, just to understand how trusted of a companion Titus is in the ministry. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13. Paul says, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ. Okay, you can see on our map, same one we used last week, pretty handy for this purpose also. So Troas is on the eastern side of the screen. It's uh, just to the left, about in a straight line if, uh, going left to right. So Troas is in northwestern Asia Minor. Northwestern Asia Minor. And Paul says, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me, my spirit was not at rest, because there's something or better, someone who is missing, because I did not find my brother Titus there. I needed me some Titus, even though I had God and I had Christ and I had the ministry, I didn't have my brother Titus. So he says, I took leave of them, so he departs from where he is in, in northwestern Asia Minor, today's Turkey, and he said, I went to there on to Macedonia. And that's just pretty much due west across the Aegean Sea. And he did this to find the one who's so valuable to him. It means so much. Just like Timothy, a true son. It says the same thing about Titus, a true son in the faith. All right, chapter 7. Titus is a big help and, and encouragement. Chapter 7 of, of 2 Corinthians, that is. Verses 5 through 7, he states, For even when we came into Macedonia... Our bodies had no rest. <laughs> Ministry is not always fun and games. But we were afflicted at every turn. You know, you have this treasure and you're teaching other people how to become rich for all eternity. You think they'd be so grateful for that. Not always is that the case. Some people fight that and they don't want the riches found in Jesus. We were afflicted, he says, at every turn, fighting without the not fun part of ministry. And fear, the issues also within, the mental anguish attached. Listen to this, what a beautiful statement. But God, who comforts the downcast. You know, we often bring up, well, how does he do it? You know, I don't know about you, but I don't really care too much. <laughs> as, long, as long as God does what he does, and he, he's awesome, and, and we glorify him for that. But I'm also grateful for pieces like this, little nuggets in the word that gives us some insight as to how. God often does these things. God who comfort. He always finds a way. And remember, this is the time when full-born miracles are going on. This isn't a miracle right here. It's just the, the common, everyday workings of God. God who finds ways, comforts the downcast, comforted us, very simple way, by the coming of Titus. You ever had that happen when you're, you're just down and, and feel out? You don't know how much more you can take. You're, you're praying for relief. Then a brother or sister in Christ will call you or drop by your house unexpectedly, do something nice for you, and, and not just to say hi, but to genuinely you know, check on you and to visit with you. And, and man, when that's over, you feel like a new person. That's Titus. And what he provides to the guy who you think wouldn't need anything. Paul says, I, I need me some Titus. I need my brother. God knew, and, and he gave me Titus at just the right time. I left Troas, I went to Macedonia, and and I'm sure he probably sent to wherever Titus was. And, and he comes to them and they're reunited. And our whole spirits were changed. We were comforted, verse 7, not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, he's serving as a messenger of the churches. Your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. What positive message does Titus bring? By the way, looking back on, uh, excuse me, I'm going the wrong direction now. Looking back on our map, the city of Corinth is found in the province of, of Achaia. And Paul mentions, I left Troas, I went to Macedonia, I had to have my brother Titus. Well, it's obvious that Titus has been in Corinth, down to the south, and so he hears about Paul's arrival, and he goes up 
and they meet up together in Macedonia. And Titus has news to deliver about the Corinthian church. What news is that? And it just makes Paul so happy that it refreshed Titus' spirit. The fights constantly, the mental anguish, and it's like, oh, this reminds you of why it's all worth it. <laughs> what good news is brought from Corinth? And I'll give you a hint. It's in response to Paul's first letter that he wrote to that place. Okay, man, you, you talk about the fights without and the mental anguish within. The letter of 1 Corinthians is nothing but problems from start to finish. And, you know, it's tough in a church to fix one problem. It's a lot tougher to fix two problems. You trace that letter, and, and when you have like 16 problems going on that are addressed all at once, I'm not trying to be a pessimist, just a realistic, or, or just a realist, but what's the likelihood the church is positively going to respond to all that correction and all at once? <laughs> but it's believed to be written the second letter about seven months later, and Titus comes from Corinth to Macedonia to meet up with Paul. And he says, it's, it's better than you could ever imagine. They have addressed everything that you've written in that letter. They have corrected all the problems. And so all that fighting on the outside, all of that mental anguish within, the apostles and, and Titus, the ministers, are reminded, it's more than worth it, isn't it? When there are souls that are, are humble and really willing to respond to the Lord's instruction. So we can go on down, and, and we will, to verses 13 and 14 of this same spot. He says, therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of, of Titus. Positivity is infectious. Our demeanors mean everything. And I think we make a mistake as, as Christians when we walk around like this. And people are, how's your day going? Uh, I'm alive. Uh, well, we're going to do it today. I guess, what time is it going to be done? You know, when that's the kind of outlook we have, that's infectious too, by the way, and nobody wants to be around us. But Paul is, is a little bit down in the dumps, and that's normal. It's okay. God gave us emotions, and sometimes we're going to be down, and we need to be picked up. And so he's begging God for comfort, and the answer God gives him is, hey, there are, there are people in this world who they still listen to Christ, they love God, and they want to do what's right. But he says, even more than that, we just looked at our brother's face and his demeanor. And we saw the joy of Titus, and that comforted us. That caused us to rejoice like the other news did, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boasts I made to him about you, he says, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. His affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. Titus is an important person in the ministry of the apostle. Uh, pretty close to that same place, you might not even have to change pages. Chapter 8 and the 6th verse, he, he's been quite instrumental in this work and the investment that's taken place in the city of Corinth. Verse 6, chapter 8, accordingly he says, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. Okay, I'm going to test your Corinthian knowledge a little bit further here. What's this act of grace in the context of 2 Corinthians 8? You know, when we hear grace, we think, oh, you know, God's favor, these people are going to become saved. No, they're already saved. That's not what he's talking about. It's a favorful act. What act? The giving. Okay. Paul has instructed them, also going back to the first letter, right? Chapter 16, on the first day of every week is the impact of the original text. The first day of every week, let each one of you lay something aside as increase has occurred in your life. God has blessed you. And to give to God as belongs to him. That instruction's made. And he says, let this happen every first day. So whenever I, I come, there's all, all of a sudden, not, oh, we got to give something. No, preparations have already been made for the Lord's work that needs to be funded around the world. So verse 6 of chapter 8, the second letter, we urge Titus that as he had started, he's been instrumental in, in getting the people to give, maybe he's the, the carrier even of, of the first letter and staying with them, uh, that he should complete among you this act of grace. Verses 16 and 17. But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same 
earnest care I have for you. Paul doesn't use those words about many people. You, you will find this also about Timothy, and you're going to struggle finding it about others. You find it about Titus too. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest. You know, he has that mentality, positivity, joy. And it mentions being very earnest himself. He is going to you of his own accord. Verse 23, as for Titus, he is my partner. And he's my fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So... Uh, one doesn't have to struggle in knowing how Paul feels about Titus and why exactly he feels that way. Now, I will toss out a, a little oddity for you, and that is you're not going to find the name of Titus in the book of Acts. Isn't that strange? <laughs> as close as he is to Paul, as, as involved as he is in the work, you're, you're not going to locate him. But we know from what we're told elsewhere how heavily he, involved he was in the work. Okay, so why is Titus written? There is a twofold purpose that's going to be accomplished here, and both of these come from verse 5 of the first chapter. The two purposes are church leadership needs to be established in these churches. You probably recall from the first missionary er efforts, chapters 13 and 14 of Acts, Paul and Barnabas said shortly after, hey, we need to go back and check on those churches and see how they're doing. And when they do so, what's the first thing they do when they return? But a point elders in every congregation without exception it seems every congregation needs leadership and we're going to talk about the reasons for that this morning so to appoint church leadership that's why he's written Titus as well as to correct false teachings that are circulating we know that's a problem in the first century we know that's still a challenge in the 21st century so Titus chapter 1 verse 5 he says for this reason I left you in Crete and looking back at our uh, map, that's the island, all the way at the bottom of the screen and a little bit toward the right side. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. What's that? And appoint elders in every city, just like Acts 14, every church here, every city where there's a church, as I commanded you. So uh, we'll see what exactly that entails, appointing strong leadership in every congregation. Before we get into just a few verses of, of the text as we wind things up, I would like to give these, and I, I encourage everyone, it's up to you if you want to do it, but to write these down or get out your phone and take a, maybe a, a shot at this, I think this is really helpful. So we know Paul is the writer of at least 13 of the 27, sorry, at least 13 of the 27 New Testament letters, right? Uh, roughly half of the New Testament. I think it helps to know around what time each of these were written and the events that are occurring. So, in the early 50s, that's, of course, all these dates are A.D., in the early 50s, he pens the first two of his inspired epistles, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. In the mid to late 50s, we have 1st and 2nd Corinthians, then Galatians, then Romans. The early 60s, there are four letters that are penned. And what might our Sunday morning adult class notice about these four in the early 60s? What's their commonality? Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians. Paul has a little extra time on his hands here. All right, that's a, yeah, that's his uh, imprisonment. That's not the one that leads to his death. That's the early one from which he's set free. Uh, and you'll notice those aren't in the order. We remembered them as Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, skip a few Philemon in the order that they're arranged. But as far as chronology, it's thought that Ephesians was probably written first then Colossians, then Philemon, and to close those with Philippians. And then finally, the preacher epistles are written in the mid to late 60s. First Timothy uh, split up on the other side with Titus, and then the final of his inspired letters, 2 Timothy. So again, I'd, I'd encourage you to jot those down, maybe take a snapshot of them, and it's helpful, to, that's half the New Testament right there, to know when it is that these letters are written. And also it makes a lot of sense because the preacher epistles are all written together at the end. Why? I think for the same reason he's calling these preachers to him individually. He wants to encourage them one more time. They're very heartfelt, these letters. Last time he's going to speak to them and he wants them to know how much he, he loves them and how they can keep these letters and read them undoubtedly through the years. And here we are 2,000 years later, still in possession 
of and reading these intimate, inspired letters of Paul. So I hope that helps some in just setting a, a chronology of the writings of the apostle. Now, I, I want to remind us, in 1 Timothy, we were wanting the truth, protecting the truth. 2 Timothy, <laughs> we are preaching the truth. And now, not in 3 Timothy, as I like to say, but Titus, we are <laughs> wanting to make sure that we are practicing, right? That we are practicing the truth. So let's keep that in mind as we study it. A church must always evaluate three things. Number one, where it has been. Number two, where it is. And number three, in what direction it is going. I'll say that again. A church must always be cognizant of three things. Number one, where we have been. Number two, where we stand. And number three, the direction where we are going. It just so happens that in Crete, the church is going to need three things. Organization, stability, and direction. And I'm going to suggest that the latter of those two depend entirely on the first of those. It is necessary for a church to have a strong leadership before, number one, she can be stable in the present, and number two, so she can have direction for the future. In Titus, we are going to be seeking to practice the truth as God's church, but God's church can't practice the truth if she doesn't know the truth. And that's the role of a minister, first to teach the truths of God to a congregation. So let's look at these first four verses in the few minutes that we have remaining. We mentioned that it is uh, penned by the Apostle Paul, the first word of the letter. So it's Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He says, according to the faith. All right, so church members here, when we find that definite article before faith, what does that tell us? Okay, we're not talking about, well, we believe subjectively, typically anyway, the subjectively we believe. No, objectively, here's the gospel, and that's the truth. And so he says that according to essentially the gospel, <clears throat> the good news of God's elect, another word of that is, is chosen. God has selected us. Oh, well, that's nice. Why has he done that? It has everything to do with the gospel. And for that matter, our response to the gospel. The same writer pens in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 13 and 14, that he has sanctified us. He has called us. And then he has chosen us. Why? Because of our belief in the truth and our response to the gospel message, the good news that he supplied. The acknowledgement also of the truth. Now that's the subjective side of things. We look at the objective body of, of fact and we're convinced that that's true. Well, then we make a mental response toward that. And we choose to put our faith in the faith, the facts, the truth, the gospel, as it's been laid out before us. An acknowledgement of the truth. We respond not only with our minds and with our words, but also with our bodies and our lives, which accords with godliness. We hear the truth, we believe the truth, and then we start practicing the truth. And when we practice the truth, things in our lives are noticeably different. Godliness, spirituality, you might say morality, virtue. People notice that about us. We notice changes within ourselves. Now listen, we don't just start living this way because we say, hey, morality is a good thing. And we think, no, why do we start being more moral, more honest? Why do we possess more integrity? Because we've learned about whom, really less about what, but when we see what godliness is in, in true human form in Christ, and we're converted to the man Jesus, then things start changing in our lives. We start to become more moral. We're more honest. We're filled with integrity. We're upright more often. Why? Not because, oh, that's a pretty neat system if one would just adopt that. No, no, no. That's Jesus. That's God in the flesh. And so we've seen perfection personified, and we try our best to emulate that. So the morality is about God-likeness, and we've learned that from the truth that's been spoken. Now, who'd like to say our memory verse, chapter 1, verse 2? What is it that motivates us? Joey, what is it that motivates you? So before the ages, or, or before the eons, before the time frames ever began, before there was such a thing as time, there was only eternity. 
And back in eternity, God spoke. And Joe, what did God say back in eternity? Before he ever invented time. I'm going to save those who are my called, my chosen. That's a promise that he, that he made. And he gave a promise. I'm going to provide eternal life. Let's say that life here goes for us, I mean, absolutely, ideally. Uh, let's say that, that we're you know, top students in our class. Let's say that we're, we're all state ball players uh, all the way through school. Let's say we, we score a 30 or above on our, our ACT. We get a bright flight scholarship. We go through, we come out, we're rocket scientists, and we become multimillionaires. And we use our money wisely, and, and we invest it, and we become multi-billionaires. And, and we have great families, and we're members of the Lord's Church, and I mean, everything. You know. How long are we going to enjoy this life? Best case scenario. And let's say we, we die, we never had any significant sickness in all of our, our lives, and, and we, we go peacefully in our sleep. I mean, you know, you couldn't draw it up any better. No major tragedies of any kind. How long are you going to enjoy that life? All right, it's over. Less than 100 years. Best case, okay, now is anyone going to live a life? No, it's not going to happen for any, all those things, all those boxes being checked. But the point of this is everything was absolutely perfect in this life. Less than 100 years. You're going to enjoy it, and it's all going to be over. Well, that kind of stinks, doesn't it? Well, it's only about this life, sure. We're not looking forward to this life. I mean, you know, we're grateful for blessings. We're optimistic. We're filled with the joy of God. Don't get me wrong. We're not, you know, that kind of people. Uh, but we're looking forward to eternal life, which in eternity was promised before time ever began. How do I really know, though, that's going to happen? I mean, is, is that not just a blind shot in the dark, really? How do I know? How, why do I have any confidence about that? <laughs> What's the first person? That's it. It's faith in the faith. It's just a comprehension of fact is all it is. And it's not simply a factual system, even though we certainly have that. But it's the one who gave it. That's what makes all the difference. God. And we're trying to be like God. And we and mentioned, you know, so then integrity and morality and more... And, and honesty. Why are we being that way? Because that's what we see in God. God is honest. He's full of integrity. When he says something, that's the way it's going to be. And before he ever invented this concept of time, there was eternity. And he said, in eternity, I'm going to give you, my chosen, what I have here. It's always been his plan. And so that's the hope that we possess. By the way, again, where do we find out about that? Verse 3. He has in due time manifested his word through preaching. When you have great news, how do you share that with others? <laughs> you have to open your mouth and let words that are meaningful fall out. Sometimes you have to convince people, no, this is, you really need to do this. This is where it's found. That's the importance of preaching. It gives us this hope of eternal life, passing on the good news of the gospel. How many times have we seen in the preacher epistles, even though there are a lot of difficulties in life, even though there are a lot of issues through which to wait. It's not bad news, and we need to make sure we're bringing that across to people. It needs to be reflected in our daily demeanors. Which was committed to me, what a privilege, according to the commandment of God, our Savior. And now Titus has been committed to you, just like he mentions to Timothy. You are a true son and in our common faith. And what a blessing that is. That we don't have to walk through this place alone. Of course, we always have God, but but even one another. And when you travel to places, Rick, you don't know someone from Adam or someone from Eve, and you walk in and you, and you see the smile and they give you a big handshake, and, and my favorite is when they grab a hold of you and, and hug you. <laughs> and you can already sense the commonality, even though you don't know each other at all. You know you're going to spend eternity together. We have a common faith. And what a joy it is, Titus, to walk with you through this place. This is not bad news. This is good news. This is a message of grace, undeserved favor, mercy, kindness shown toward the afflicted. It's a message of peace when there was division and animosity from God the Father, relationship, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our helper, our Savior, when we needed it. What good news there is. And it's helpful to be reminded, what good news do I share with with someone who didn't finish school, who is unemployed right now? Uh, what news do I share with someone who's broke and, and who might lose a, a dwelling? What good news do I share with someone who's lost a loved one 
in this life? What good news do I share with someone who's just received bad news and there's not long left to live? How about this? It's not about this life. It's about the next life. It's about eternal life that God had in mind for us all along. It's not a message that God's mad at you and, and you're lost in your sin and there's no, no. It's that God loves you. He gave his son to die in your place. He extends to you his undeserved favor, kindness in your affliction. And he doesn't want to be at odds with you anymore. He wants to have peace with you. If you don't have a family right now, he wants you to be a part of the best family there is. God wants to be your father. And if you're lost, you have someone who's ready to save you. You just need to respond to his message. And that's the good news of Christ of which Timothy's being reminded. Okay, any final thoughts uh, through the first four verses and introduction to Titus? Yes, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, probably so. Yeah, good, good point. Constantly being questioned, and unfortunately he has to make a little defense of that too, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, well said, Roy. Okay, so for next time, if you will, uh, read the remainder of, of chapter 1, and let's uh, memorize verse 5. And it's going to be a helpful reminder to us that the single greatest asset for a church's membership, and as well, the single greatest asset for a, a church's preacher, is a strong leadership. How do we obtain that? How do we maintain that? We'll discuss next time we get together. Thanks.